If everybody takes seats, this is going to be a really, uh, uh, I think, a lot of fun panel, not just because I'm on it, uh, but uh, we've got some new colleagues here. Gio Capriglione just rolled in. Good to have him here with us from the greater Coppell area of Texas. Uh, Fort Worth, Coppell, what? It's over there. Colleyville. Okay. All right. We'll have this conversation later offline. But for right now, we're going to enjoy one more last vignette. Uh, from SFA, uh, Nick, if you would roll them, and then we'll introduce our moderator and get to work. I've been dancing since I was about two or three years old, pretty much as long as I can remember. When I was 13, I found out that I had scoliosis. The summer after I graduated high school, I had to have surgery. And by that point, my spine was not only extremely crooked, but it was rotating. At first, when they told me that dancing was definitely going to be affected, you know, it took me just a couple of days, and I just realized that there's a reason. There was a reason why God gave me this talent. And no matter what, I was going to find a way to do it. The faculty here embraces more of what dance is really about. You know, it's not about really the technique and everything, it's about the passion behind it. We're getting a new fine arts building, and I'm very excited about it. It's nice knowing, you know, SFA sees that we have a program that is worth showing off with such a beautiful facility. In the future, I definitely want to perform. I have one more year, and I graduate, and I want to perform a part of a company. But eventually, I want to go and I want to get my master's so that I can teach dance at a college. I would love to teach at SFA. <laughs> All right, well, after we get through, we'll dance. So uh, with that, I'm going to bring our moderator up here. John Hendricks, where are you? I've got my book here. This is, uh, you know, one of the things we like to do with our programs is really highlight the talent that we have here in Nacogdoches in East Texas. And so we, we adopted, I always try to have one fun, pardon the word, sexy kind of, you know, spicy uh, issue to take up. Uh, I knew you'd like that, John. No, just... And so, and this was one we thought about with the social media, the, the social d dilemma, and you've seen these shows. We've had a robust debate on bills in the Texas legislature uh, about the role of social media. And, you know, who watches the watchman? Who controls the algorithms? Who gets to say what you get to see and what you don't? And it's very topical. It's very timely. And I said, let's find somebody who can be the moderator of this. And I found none other than, than Dr. Hendricks. Now, now, John has been with us at the Lone Star Legislative Summit moderating our media madness panel and he's done an exceptional job but he's got a promotion this year and we're bringing him in because i was unaware honestly of, of his uh, his work that he's done in this very area he's authored and edited 12 books on the topics of media and politics uh, the presidency and social media discourse disruption and digital democracy in the 2016 campaign several this is his we're in his wheelhouse so uh I tried to get a couple members in here that would challenge him and his thoughts. Um, yeah, I'm looking at you, Gio. And, uh, and JC down there on the end, this, this is a, a, a sharp panel we get to work with. And uh, I'm just the fourth guy in the middle. So uh, I'll try to chime in every once in a while. But John, come on up here and get started. Dr. Henry. All right, thank you, Travis. <laughs> is this me? Thank you for the kind the introduction. Uh, we are the last panel of the day, but this is going to be the most interesting panel of the day. Uh, the representatives and I agree that uh, Travis is going to make it the most interesting <laughs> of the day, but also the topic uh, will make it uh, interesting as well. And uh, several of them had not seen the questions in advance, and so I showed it to them, and they freaked out just a little bit. And then I had to remind them, I'm a professor, so I'm going to do a little teaching before I ask the questions. So uh, I, I, I tried to, uh, to uh, allay any of their concerns. So I'd like to introduce to you our panel today. The first one is Representative uh, Capriglione. Did I totally butcher that? It's good. 
Uh, he was elected to the Texas House of Representatives in 2012 and is serving his fifth term representing District 98, which encompasses all or part of Grapevine, Colleyville, South Lake, Keller, Westlake, North Fort Worth, and Hazlitt. He uh, currently serves on the House Committee on Pension, Investments, and Financial Services the House Committee on Appropriations, and he chairs the Appropriations Subcommittee on Article II. He's the chairman of the Innovation and Technology Caucus and a member of the following House Caucuses. The Manufacturers Caucus, the Rural Caucus, the Sportsman's Caucus, and it goes on and on. Uh, needless to say, uh, he doesn't go and sleep uh, when the legislative session is in uh, process. Next up is, uh, and I've got these out of order, is Mr. McClarty. Uh, uh, Travis is a, uh, a lifelong Republican, proud to represent the people of Cherokee, Nacogdoches, and Rust counties. Uh, he's been a tireless advocate for us here at home and in Austin for local law enforcement, educators, business, and residents. I know that he has been a strong advocate for us here at SFA. Currently, uh, Travis serves as a member of the House Committee on Elections and the House Committee on Culture, Recreation, and uh, Tourism. During his tenure in the legislature, he's also served on the Homeland Security and Public Safety Committee, the Human Services Committee, the Higher Education Committee, and the Local and Consent Calendars Committee. If there is a prestigious award to give, Travis has received it. And so we're uh, quite honored to have Travis as our representative here in Deep East Texas. Next up is uh, Representative Busey, John Busey III. He is a native Texan and small business owner. He is from District 1 in the Texas House of Representatives, first elected in 2018. He represents Western Williamson County, including Northwest Austin, Cedar Park, Leander, and the Brushy Creek area. He was appointed to the House Committee on Elections and the House Committee on Transportation for the 87th Legislative Session, as well as the Constitutional Rights and Remedies Select Committee. He previously served the Culture, Recreation, and Tourism Committee as well. He's chair of the Young Tex Legislative Caucus. He's vice chair of the Innovation and Technology Caucus, so glad to have you on this panel and he formerly served on the Capital Area Council of Governments. Last and certainly not least is Representative uh, J.C. Jetton. Uh, J.C. is a seventh generation, uh, generation Texan who represents Fort Bend County in the Texas House. He serves on the committees for redistricting uh, public health, um, elections, the Policy Committee for the Texas House Republican Caucus, and the Select Committee on Constitutional Rights and Remedies. And during the 87th legislative session, he was voted Freshman uh, of the Year by his peers. So uh, good for you. Congratulations. So everybody in here has one of these. And uh, I, I think that that is what we're sort of going to talk about today is the role that these and the apps on them from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram and all of the other ones play in the uh, election process. I'm looking at a, a survey from the Pew Research Center. And it says that the majority of Americans say that social media negatively affects the way that things are going in the country. In fact, 64% of Americans say that social media is mostly negative when it comes to politics. If we look at it through a social prism, we see that 78% of Republicans believe that social media content when it comes to uh, politics is negative compared to 53% of Democrats. So that polarization that we are witnessing in politics is certainly being seen in social media. And so what I want to try to do today is sort of discuss and unpack some of that 
and get a feel from our leaders in the state uh, about what's going on. And so the first thing that we have to do, I sort of have to play professor here and give you a background on what is known as Section 230, because if you have paid any attention to recent elections, you've heard politicians talk about Section 230. President Trump called for its uh, re revocation. Uh, even President Joe Biden uh, on the campaign trail, he called for it to be revoked as well. And so there is some discussion on both sides of the aisle, uh, both at the federal level and at the state level. So what is Section 230? It provides immunity to providers of interactive computer services, including social media providers like Facebook and Twitter, uh, both for certain decisions to host content created by others. That's why Twitter was able to uh, ban President Trump from their account and eventually Facebook. Um, and also for actions taken voluntarily and in good faith to restrict access to objectionable material. In March of 21, the Wall Street Journal said that Section 230 provides both a shield and a sword. These companies are not liable for harmful content as a user posts on their sites. That's the shield. And Section 230 gives companies a sword because they can remove that content that they deem uh, objectionable without any liability whatsoever as long as they act in, quote, good faith. In general, there is a concern that Section 230 gives the big tech companies uh, way too much power to determine what information the American public gets to see. Democrats generally believe uh, the platforms allow too much negative content to spread, while Republicans often say the platforms censor content with a conservative viewpoint. So, gentlemen, I know that this is a federal issue here, but it is trickling down to the state level. Therefore, states are beginning to address issues related to Section 230, and we'd like to hear your thoughts today on Section 230. Should it be revoked? Should it be modified? And if so, uh, in what manner and why? And we'll just start here and go down the table. Sure. Uh, thank you. You know, one of the things you said is that um, Trump was president, wanted to get rid of it. Biden's president, wanted to get rid of it. So a lot of times people will think, okay, well, if the two parties agree, then it must be okay. I would tell you in this case, run. Uh, sometimes <laughs> when both parties agree, you either watch your wallet or uh, something else. <laughs> Here's the thing with Section 230, and it's a lot of legalese, and I'm sure there's people disagree, but I'll tell you this. I look at the analogy as having your own coffee shop. You're a privately owned business. You have your own coffee shop and you have a bulletin board. You have a bulletin board in the back, you run the place and someone goes and posts something. They get a push pin and they put something on there that you don't like or that's object objectionable or like the genesis of 230 is copyrighted in some way. Should the business owner be sued because someone put something up in their coffee shop? I think most people would say, well, it wasn't it wasn't the business owner's fault. Someone else did it. When they finally found out about it, they took it down. Shouldn't be sued. On the other hand, if someone goes and puts something on that bulletin board that the business owner, for whatever reason, doesn't like, doesn't agree with the politics, just doesn't like that person, for me, that business owner should be able to remove it as well without liability. When you look at it as a private company and a private business, to me, that's that's a totally acceptable way. And so for social media companies, that's what happened to them. People were posting things on there that some people found objectionable. And the social media companies at some point said, well, it's not our fault necessarily that they posted it. If you go to a site like Facebook or YouTube, it's a monumental task to keep track of all of that. And so to me, if you think it's okay uh, for that coffee shop owner to be sued, then yeah, I think you would agree with getting rid of 230. But for me, I, I think it, it makes sense for it to be as a stand. 
Well, let's carry that analogy just a little farther. And let's say the coffee shop owner doesn't just have a single billboard that they look at occasionally. They have dozens of, of uh, uh, boards that things could be pinned to, and then they control who walks by those pin boards and which pin boards they choose to look at. And then, all by the way, uh, they make more money steering certain people in front of those billboards based upon the heat of the moment. And they know through their algorithms, uh, this is very comp this is very uh, expensive coffee because they cook with algorithms, uh, but, they, the, but that they, they are able to monetize the value of those billboards to those segments and they know what's hot and what will generate more activity. And therefore, uh, they sell a lot more coffee and become publicly traded in one of the new, uh, you know, multi-gazillion dollar companies that didn't exist 20 years ago. Uh, and have gotten to that stage with little, very little regulatory oversight. Uh, you can go back into the days of uh, Theodore Roosevelt when he broke, broke up the trust. It took them decades to build those companies to those sizes, and finally something had to be done at a regulatory level. Same challenges you hear from the companies now, what you heard from the, the monopolies back in the day of the, the, when those were broken up. Uh, that you don't understand our business, it's too sophisticated, it's too complicated, you're too behind the times, you can't regulate us. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. Now, do I want to do anything to promote censorship? No, nor do, and do I want to uh, uh, do anything that's going to uh, uh, shrink the uh, free exchange of ideas? Absolutely not. Uh, but I think we do have a responsibility as regulators. I'll tell, you all know I like to tell stories. Um, and But one, one quick one, I think is Geo probably 2014, 15, I was invited to a legislative delegation to go out to uh, Silicon Valley. We did the tour of Facebook, YouTube, those companies. They were really emerging at that. They were forces, but they were emerging, and, and since then they've, they've done what they've done. Um, and I remember several conversations. If you want to know the takeaway of the, the, the people that were leading this discussion and the tours and whatever, uh, including the general counsel, I think, for Google, um, it was basically... You guys don't understand what we're doing. You aren't really smart enough to figure it out. And by the time you solve the problems you think exist, we've solved those five years ago or two years ago. And you just have to stay out of our way and trust us. And my response then and remains, uh, we'll trust you, but you only get one strike. And I think right now a lot of people in America feel like they've gotten their strike and it's not working and there are real legitimate concerns about how they control and shape the dialogue and the discussions of things, uh, both to the right and the left. I mean, to me, this is really not a, a partisan issue. It's not, oh, it's yet to be this side with Trump or, or this side with Biden. It's, it's uh, you know, there's a certain, uh, you know, 1984 Orwellian sort of concern that if we keep going down this slippery slope, uh, we, we really are not in, in control of our lives or the thoughts we have or what is history and how is it revised and changed uh, at, at the whim of somebody who we don't know or the person who pro uh, created the algorithm. So um, I, I think we do need uh, to look at this, but that's why I'm glad Jill's here and Jacy's here and even I'm glad John's here, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that we, we need to be thoughtful and, cr and, and creative about this, but we're going to need to bring better minds in. And we do need, I will say one thing, uh, I don't know if you remember, the, we had the special uh, committee that we heard the, the elections bill led during the special sessions, uh, and one of the, um, uh, and they came and testified. They didn't bring their A-team to testify. They, 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 these weren't their, the talk, top people uh, with Google or Facebook or you know, whatever. Uh, that wasn't them. They brought in some hired guns, mid-level people, just go in there, take the bullet, and get out. Uh, they were not interested in exchanging ideas or being helpful in the process. They weren't there to try to engage in a dialogue to help us work through these issues. It, the, 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 the attitude seemed to me as a legislator uh, that you just need to leave us alone. And it's, uh, uh, it was pretty, it's fairly stark in their attitude. So um, that's kind of my view on that, and I'll, uh, I'd love to hear what John has to say. <laughs> uh, one, let me say, in the spirit of what we've been talking about, we've heard it from the speaker this morning, we've heard it from Representative Clardy. I am friends with these three individuals. I'm uh, across the aisle from them. But we do these events, and we learn each other, about each other, and we build this camaraderie so we can work on these issues together and then move on to the next issue the next day. And I think that's vital, and I think it's something unique about the Texas legislature is how bipartisan we are when it comes to being friends and when it comes to working on issues. And with that said, I'm going to say I agree entirely 
with what Chairman Capriglione had to say mm -hmm. about this. I think uh, I've used a different analogy, sometimes talking about a restaurant or sometimes talking about Walmart, which is a massive company that still has the right when someone comes in and spews racist comments to remove that individual. But in your example, your ongoing example of the coffee shop, I would say, Representative Clardy, then if you don't like the way that coffee shop does business, go to a different coffee shop. You have to have some responsibility. We all have to have responsibility when we make these decisions around using private companies in their industry. And, and, I, and I think that's the really thing, the, the heart of the conversation here that we need to make sure we don't lose is that we have a responsibility to turn off Facebook, turn off Twitter. I've watched this documentary we're going to talk about in a minute. It was incredibly scary it's how some of these algorithms work. You know, my wife and I watched it together, and what she did is she then went through, and it took her so much time because they don't want you to do this. She went and unfollowed every single person or entity on Facebook. So now her newsfeed is blank. And with a blank newsfeed, she uses Facebook solely how she chooses to without it feeding her. And so that was a conscious decision she made. I think we have a responsibility, and we have to be careful not to lose that responsibility as, in my opinion, these are private companies. They're big private companies. They have influence but we give them that influence as well. This is not the same thing as an open forum. It's not the same thing as, as a, a college campus where we're debating and we're learning and we're having uh, protests, nonviolent protests. That's free speech. That should be protected. Books in our libraries so we can have other ideas and read should be protected. This is a different type of conversation. This private business. And if I don't like the coffee they're making at this coffee shop, I'm going to go to the other coffee shop. Sounded like a Republican. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been hanging out in East Texas. So yeah. JC. Sure. And so I, I diverge a little bit from both, or some of the arguments that have been listed. Um, you know, the, the big argument or, or the big part of this bill was to focus in on those social media outlets that had 50 million users or more. And when you have 50 million users, you can get a certain amount of ad dollars that facilitate you being able to advance your technology and um, through that at some point you create a barrier of entry that other social media platforms are not able to enter into and this is where once you get to that point do people have the ability then to start a another social media platform they'll you know favor a different um, viewpoint and, and, and viewpoint's a big part of this. This, this is, was the, there was two points that were really made during the Constitutional Rights and Remedies uh, Committee hearing, which was, at some point, there are so many people on these platforms that they're no longer just a, a, a news outlet or a, just a regular business outlet, but they become a co common carrier. And once they become a common carrier, that changes the amount of discretion that certain individuals get in determining what is allowed on those platforms. You don't get to decide which, which phone calls you want to accept when it goes through the telephone lines. You don't get to decide what, uh, what is viewed at the end of uh, you know, TV, uh, televisions. It's become common carrier. And so that was the first thing. And then the other part was viewpoint discrimination. And I think that that is, that is the concern that some of us have. And you see that in the, the, the polling data that was shown between Republicans' viewpoints of this and Democrats' viewpoints. One is getting discriminated against more than the other. And if you don't have the ability to then start another platform that is able to get to, you know, to attract the ad dollars, to attract the revenue, to allow them to have the sophistication in their, um, in their, in their websites the same way that Facebook, Twitter, and some of these others are able to, then you, you, you've created a barrier that's not going to allow that other free speech to come in. Um, there's a... Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a scripture that uh, I'd like to read. Um, it's one that uh, we've, uh, um, it's from, out of the book of James, and it says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of this uh, deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. It's out of James 3, 8, 8 and 9. This is a thing that is, is not left or right. It's not a, um, it is not a Republican, Democrat, both sides have the tongue that is, can create hate, that can cause the things that some people don't want to hear on either side. And the decision has to be made, do we want social media platforms to be able to make the decision on what's hate and what's not, um, or what viewpoint is allowed and what not, is not allowed on there? All right. Um, 
Remember your remarks about common carrier. I'm going to come back sure. to you on that. <laughs> okay. um, so now at the state level to address concerns surrounding uh, Section 230 to a certain extent, in September of 2021, Governor Abbott signed into law HB 20. Uh, the law makes it illegal for big social media companies to ban users based on their political viewpoints. HB 20 also requires social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, those with more than 50 million monthly users in the U.S., to produce regular reports of removed content, create a complaint system, and disclose their content regulation procedures. Gio, how do you see that affecting politics in Texas in particular, but if, it, if other states do what has been done in the past where they mimic uh, legislation that is passed in Texas, how could it ripple out nationally? Sure. So full disclosure, I'm one of, I think, only one or two Republicans that voted against uh, that particular bill. So I disagree with it. Um, in its entirety, mostly because we have a First Amendment. And a lot of people talk about this and in, in that it's free speech, right? Well, I mean, literally, uh, the beginning of the First Amendment says, Congress shall pass no law. And so what the Texas legislature did is said, we're going to pass a law. And we're going to go and we're going to say, who can say what? And if you say what we don't want you to say or, or don't say what we want you to say, we're going to write you up. We want that report. And we're going to specifically pick a, a few companies. In, in my world, um, you know, we see what the elections were. But there's another universe where um, Hillary Clinton won. It's not one we like. But it's another world where Hillary Clinton was president. She was banned. And Republicans are the ones who are opposed to this kind of bill, and Democrats are the ones who said, let's say we should do this. To me, this was a completely partisan type of conversation that we're having, is that we need to do this. I will I'll tell you my opinion of why not the A team came in, but the B team is, because they know that the court's going to throw this bill out. Um, we, we followed Florida technically on this bill. Theirs was already essentially overturned, and, and I think the Supreme Court's just waiting in June, um, quite frankly, to put this all in the shredder, because there is, we are not, because what this bill also does is, and I don't know if we're gonna talk about common carrier later, but how it affects politics is, we've now made Facebook and Twitter part of the political discourse. You know where I hear most people complain about Facebook? on Facebook. Uh, most people complain to me about Twitter on Twitter. And there is a free market solution to this. The, the government doesn't have to have a board position. A private individual who's upset with the company can take a board seat. Um, and it turns out a Texan did not too long ago. And that's probably the right way uh, to fix this. I'm trying to remember what the question was oh, about sorry. the bill. Yeah, about yeah, the that, bill. Well, it, I will say this is agree. this is an interesting point. Well, I was one of the Republicans that did vote for the bill, uh, as I believe uh, uh, J.C. did as well. So, but what's interesting is that we have a, a Democratic colleague, Republican colleague, two voted for, one against, and one against. Uh, it, it, and I think that just really speaks to the fact this is a complicated issue. Uh, and again, I think we all agree on the basics and the fundamentals, but. The, the, the size and rapidity with which these organizations have grown and their control over discourse. And I don't say control, but it's, you know, you say that you shall not pass a law abridging uh, or infringing upon the right of free speech. I would flip that on some heads and say, no, this wasn't a law infringing their right to free speech. What we're doing is protecting the free speech of those people whose voices are being squelched because they're not getting their message onto these platforms. Uh, and I, I remember at the hearing deal, we had the. Um, now, Can you guys there. hear Travis? Oh, whatever, whatever the hot button issue, I'm not sure they want to. Um, <laughs> that uh, whatever the hot button issue was of the day, you know, whatever was trending, I just picked up while we were in the committee and hit that button and looked at it and found something on Twitter uh, and scrolled down. And you get down there, and so you go through these comments, and then you get that warning. Ooh, some of the comments expressed below you might find offensive or terrible or nasty or whatever their, their little inscription is. And I, I, when I see that, I want to see what they had to say. And so, uh, you know, maybe salacious, I might like this. So I click that button, 
And then you read those comments. And those comments are substantively no different than those comments that were not screened, that were not blocked out, that were not excluded from the discourse. They're the same comments, or competing comments perhaps, but the same comments, nothing about them in any way vulgar, vile, you know, violating any standards of decency. They just happen to be posted by someone who might have liked a post by someone they found offensive. And and, uh, and I think the case in point typically was if you say, who was this person and why did that say? They probably liked something about President Trump. They probably said something about January 6th. They commented on some other issue which the algorithm caught and said, this what they say is offensive, therefore their voice should not be heard. That, to me, is the infringement on free speech. So, again, it, it's difficult because there's competing interests. Um, but the one other thing that really compounds this is the sheer volume of information that we're dealing with. This was, I think, I said 14, 15, I'm out there. Uh, I think they just bought YouTube at that time or were closing on the deal. Uh, and at that, I think they said every five minutes, memory serves, and maybe it's been a minute, but every five minutes, I think that's right, they were uploading uh, 1,000 hours of video onto their mainframes with all the videos that we click and you want to go see, you know, cats playing with mice and up jumps the videos. It, and and I, I, I would, uh, I think it's a fair wager that that, uh, that uh, volume has increased exponentially, not linearly, since that time. And so how do you police that? And so on one end you say, well, it's these, these evil algorithms, but there's no other way to monitor it with that volume. So it, it's this really more than cutting edge technology that we're grappling with, but at the end of the day, it affects our public discourse. The thing that really troubles me the most, uh, we talk about the common carrier, but I'm gonna talk about common ground. One of the problems, and I'm, let's put it in something we all understand, uh, you watch the, the news. There are folks in here that only watch Fox News. And there are other folks who mistakenly only watch CNN. And, and you can watch the same news or the same cycle and, and in oftentimes you're living in completely different worlds. The, the storylines are different, everything's different. And so, and then when people, I can't believe they believe this, why aren't they, why don't they do what we think they ought to do? Why are they being so close-minded? They never hear this narrative. And, and it works both ways. And so we have, our, our common ground is shrinking, which is one of the things I do love about the Texas legislature. We, I think, really work hard to try to find common ground, to not look for divisive issues that drive us apart because that does not help the people of Texas. It doesn't help us find good policy. We've got to find that common ground and then file off those rough edges. Uh, we did not do a perfect job with HB 20. I'll be the first to say that. Uh, but at least we joined the issue and, and moved it down the road. And I think we will continue this conversation next session. But we've, you know, the, the way that the, the, I think it's more insidious the way that the, the social media platforms segregate their markets, segregate their populations or their audiences to really where there's exclus absolute exclusivity, at least with Fox and CNN, they're going to hit some of the same stuff with some of the same facts. But you never see those things. And why? Because you haven't unclicked your interest and your likes and you haven't told them what movies you like to watch and you haven't you know, shared with them who all your friends are and, and boom. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a troubling time we find ourselves in. You know, I didn't oppose this bill because I love social media. This isn't a defense of, you know, loving Facebook and thinking everything they're doing is right or Twitter. In fact, I, I tend to feel the opposite. I, I have this conversation a lot is do the benefits of social ma media outweigh the negatives? And I struggle to say yes to that question. But that's not what we're talking about. And, and, and I think too often we're confusing do we want to partake in a business or not as opposed to what is the role of government here? I don't think we need big government regulating private business like this one. I think, too, when we talk about common carriers, Professor, I, I have the definition here, and, and then we'll see if the audience thinks Facebook would fit into the definition, but a common carrier is defined by U.S. law as a private or public entity that transports goods or people from one place to another for a fee. I don't pay for a Facebook account. I don't pay for a Twitter account. I don't think anyone else here does. Um, it doesn't meet the definition. Now, yes, can federal law redefine things? Can we have that conversation? Absolutely we can. I was just having a conversation where we said, well, in the legislature, we make the law, so we can change the law. But it doesn't meet that definition at this time. We knew that this bill wouldn't hold up. 
We followed Florida's lead, uh, in my opinion, for bad political reasons on this bill. Uh, it was political grandstanding. We followed Florida. The courts had already shut it down there. They've already injunctioned this bill here. Um, it's not going to happen. This is a federal debate. It's a federal decision. And what we're doing is trying to define a company that we don't like, a private entity, in something that it's not. And, 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 and the courts did latch on to the common carrier argument as well when they issued the injunction for Florida's Bill 7072 as well as Texas's Bill uh, HB 20. Yeah, that, absolutely. And, and so, yes, I think there are a lot of reasons that I can be mad at social media. There's a lot of reasons why I can be frustrated with it. I think it does divide us. I think it does bring out some of the worst in us. But then I think that's why I get in my Jeep, I drive to Big Ben, and I turn the internet off sometimes. We have to be able to turn it off and walk away. Same with Fox News and MSNBC and CNN. Turn it off and walk away sometimes. So, yeah. so I, think, I think one of the biggest problems we have with this being a federal issue is that it's a potentially a federal issue, and we don't have a federal government that is functioning at the point where it can actually achieve much right now, and for many years now. And I think that the people of Texas have demanded of um, their elected representatives at the state level to address these things that the state or that the federal government refuses to or is not capable of. Um, we're, we're finding that with the border, we're finding that with a lot of different issues where the state is having to fill that gap. And so I think as long as that gap is there, the state of Texas should continue to look at ways to make sure that uh, we're protecting the, the viewpoints of all Texans. Um, and that's, and that's, I think that's what this battle is over, is, is the, the, the ability to have viewpoints on both sides of the aisle um, equally transmitted through these social media networks. And so the question is, how does this impact um, politics? I think that's I think that's very much it. If we're worried about the algorithms shaping uh, which posts you see or which uh, which ads you see and that impact on culture, um, the, the same applies to the conservative or liberal viewpoints um, being equally visible on these platforms, so that uh, they can have that impact. And so I, I think that as as long as that is that is the case, I think we have struggles that we need to. Uh, address there, and um, I think I think to get on that board, I think Elon Musk had to spend about two point was it two point six four billion dollars, <laughs> and so it's not uh, any any kind of board position that I'm going to find myself on, or uh, probably many people in this room. So, <laughs> yeah. all right. So let's uh, let me be a little uh, tougher, maybe, on this question. So the U.S. Constitution guarantees. Uh, First Amendment rights, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. The Supreme Court has ruled that a privately owned bakery in Colorado cannot, does not have to bake wedding cakes for gay couples because that is against their freedom of religion and they are a privately owned business and they do not have to offer those services. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled on that. How is it any different for these companies other than the technology aspect of it that if a company says these are our beliefs and the consumer or the customer has violated those beliefs and we're not going to offer our services to them so they delete accounts. What is the difference? There is none. I mean, there really isn't one. And when and and and, and by the way, that's not a gotcha. I ask my uh, professor, questions. Professor, I think you're going to get all but Geo in trouble up here. Well, <laughs> I ask that question in my media law class every single semester, and it stumps a lot of students. But I think it's a legitimate question. I, it, when uh, if you go back and see the debate, this is one of the examples I had, and I gave to one of the members who I know I'm sure 100% supported that decision with the bakery, he said, well, that's different. It's only different in the sense of what the product is, okay? And I guess some people would say, well, it's different because of the size. But it is not different. Does a private business, does a private individual have the ability to go and decide whether or not they're going to sell or not sell to certain individuals who are not protected in some other way? I would say yes, and I would think mo most people who follow the Constitution 
would, would agree with that. And, and the Supreme Court is going to have to look at that precedent that they themselves did and, and dot, dot, dot over to this ruling as well. But I think what really this comes down to is people don't see cakes or social media differently. People are not addicted, or not that many people are addicted to cake. There are a lot of people addicted to social media. And I guess this is, but just because we have the power, okay, legally to go and try and stop something we find um, that we don't like as, as private individuals doesn't mean that we should. And I'm not going to pick on anybody here, but there are people here looking at their cell phone. We're talking about social media and all that stuff. And the rest of you are like, well, where is my cell phone? And, and it's just become something that we've made part of our lives, but I don't want to put it, and I will never want it to be on the same level as other common carriers like the phone or utilities. A lot of my fellow members say, well, it should be, it should be just like a utility. Really? A free Facebook app we want to put on the same level as water and electricity? To me, that's really the problem, is how we have just become, just, uh, just can't stop using that product. But to me, that's no different than the cake. Okay. And I think uh, what Gio's expression is kind of a, a view which we share. That when we, I think every thinking American is a small L libertarian, and we don't want a nanny state intruding on people's decisions. If you don't want to be an alcoholic, don't start drinking. You know, it, there's a certain personal responsibility for these things. But I do think there's a fundamental difference, and I do think the cases are distinguishable between, between the cake. Because, you know, one of the things I, I say oftentimes in the legislature in a number of different contexts, and it's virtually always true, is if you want to know the truth, you follow the money. When you're talking about these sincerely held religious beliefs, which was the, at the thrust of the, the cake case in uh, Colorado, uh, it's very clear to those of us that share Christian heritage where that faith came from, where they der derived those opinions, and it wasn't about the money. They, they wanted to sell more cakes. They wanted to have more customers, but they said, but this, uh, I would rather not make this money and not sell this cake. And that was a personal private decision. But there is no guiding ethos with these companies. They are corporations. They are soulless entities. Uh, but they are controlled by somebody. The one thing I really appreciate about Geo and our service together, he's really, I would say, a, a leader uh, in our chamber, and I think really in the legislature, on issues dealing with transparency. Uh, and he and I find, have found a lot of common ground through the years, particularly on other issues. Uh, and I will say the one most notably that we always get to hear about every primary season is uh, about taxpayer-funded lobbying. GEO solved this problem a couple of sessions ago, and the solution is very simple. It is transparency. Yes, should people know how their tax dollars are being spent so that they can make a decision whether they want to return those elected officials back to office if they've wasted money on stupid things? People deserve to know how tax dollars are being spent. So the fix was not, you can't do that, you can't hire these people. The fix is, you just have to tell the people you're accountable to that elected you how the money spent, what the terms of the agreements are, what the scope of the representation was, et cetera, et cetera. That is the cure. In this instance, I go back to that hearing. There was no, and maybe I just missed the signals, but I don't think so. There was no, no indication whatsoever, nor to this day has there been any indication. In fact, by, you can look at how hard they're fighting the litigation uh, to try to, to uh, set aside these, these uh, statutes. They have no desire to open the kimono. They have no desire to, to, to exercise transparency and say, well, here's how these decisions are really made. And I think then they hide behind other business principles back to the money. Oh, this is proprietary information. These are our uh, personal algorithms. Here's how we do that. But we're not going to show anybody else. It might give, it might, we might lose a competitive advantage. Well, you can't have it both ways. They. Like you say, one thing is a commercial enterprise, but they are only about the money. So this this um, supposition that they are exercising their uh, free speech and exercising their values, I just don't. I don't think it is uh, comparable, really, at all. I don't think our chairman was quite able to elucidate the, the position I just took uh, when he uh, uh, said well, that's different. Uh, I think it is different, and I think there's good reasons it's different. So again, we have, as we have a responsibility as a legislature to hold entities, corporations accountable. Uh, my, you know, our friends to the left, we just had the energy panel. They want to see 
um, energy companies held responsible to be uh, to, to do the right things in the field as they produce energy and they do those things. We want to have disclosures made to know what they're doing. Uh, we expect that in other industries, and I don't think it's unreasonable for us to expect that and to have a, a, a level of, of uh, understanding, openness, uh, and transparency uh, so we aren't uh, concerned about them uh, somehow influencing political thought or, or changing the political world we operate in. Your turn. You know, to your point, I think some of that transparency we talk about is the difference between government and private business, though, and government being, which is what I think uh, the chairman was making a noise at when you made the comment. But it's a difference. I think that's a difference. We have to be a difference. We're dealing with taxpayer money. We're dealing with a spot that's not a business we created, but we got elected to sit on a seat for a while temporarily, as long as the voters let us. To the question, I think it's a very good one. It's, it's, a, it's a tough one. It, how do we answer it without looking hypocritical. And, and I think to that is, uh, you know, a roundabout way of saying we have certain things in this country that you are not allowed to discriminate on. Race, gender, in my opinion, in my beliefs, LGBT should be included in that. And so I don't agree, despite what I've said about social media today, I don't agree with the bakery having that choice. I think the interpretation of ultimate protection sh should be extended to the LGBT community. Um, up there with race and gender. And so, is that a direct answer? I don't, probably not. I'm trying to give you a, a, maybe a politician's answer, but I think we need to fix that, and that therefore it would fit into what I believe about uh, why I don't think the bakery should have that right. Representative Jett. So, I, I, I think there's a difference, and the, and the biggest one is kind of what I've been harping on. Um, I, I think that if you want to go and start a bakery, corner bakery, you can get the ingredients, you can get your grandma's cookbook and put, a, put together some uh, recipes, and you can go open up that bakery down the street. Um, I don't think anybody in this room would have the capacity or the ability to go and start a social media network, um, and, and that, that becomes the big difference. It's that barrier of entry, the, the 50 million people that exist on these platforms, and trying to replicate that is not, not the same as what you can do with a, a corner bakery. And I, I think that's by far the biggest difference. Um, when we look back to, um, you know, when Microsoft was going through the issues that they were with uh, Windows being on every PC and um, Internet Explorer, the, the government has stepped in at different times to make sure that there was opportunities for uh, competition. And when there wasn't that, then there was regu you know, regulations that went along with it. I think that there is a point when the government does need to step in, and I think that this was a point that uh, the Texas legislature attempted to um, jump into to make sure that, again, that different viewpoints had an opportunity to be expressed on uh, these social media networks. And Thank you. I'm going to stay on that end of the table. By the way, John, I'm going to now my time. I'm wearing my timekeeping hat. I want to make sure it, it's. Uh, why don't we go about another. Ten minutes to four thirty. Is that Are a fit? Anybody out there? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just saying four thirty. I'm censoring you. Yes, I am. No, I was no. I, I want Gio to have the opportunity to say whatever he wants to, as long as I get the last word. <laughs> okay. So, so you you, you kind of set my next question up. Um, if people can buy the ingredients for the cake and all, and they can bake their own wedding cake, but they can't uh, create their own uh, social networking platforms. There are some observers of this argument that would say that there are, there's no need for bills like HB 20 because there are so many social media outlets like Geb and Getter and Parler and the list goes on and on and on that allows for rhetoric and content that can't be found elsewhere on outlets such as Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all of it. So if there's any type of private entity dictating content, could an argument be made that it's free press at all? And you know, what what are your thoughts on that? So I, I, I'm not familiar with other social media platforms. <laughs> I'm sure that they are out there. Um, I, I think that the, the, the again the, the barrier of entry is largely why you're not going to find as many users on those different venues. It's people are going where people are at. Um, when they have the number of people on these platforms that they do, that's what attracts them to it. And when you have 
50 plus million people on your platforms and you're wanting to communicate with other people that are, that are on there, it, the, the, the viewpoints that you want to express, um, you know, ha have, ha have the same, I, I believe, rights to be on there as the other viewpoints. You can, you can discriminate on a lot of different things, but I, I, or you shouldn't discriminate on a lot of different things, and, and one of those uh, as well should not be the viewpoints. And so, uh, continue to stand, on, stand firm that uh, these platforms, uh, when you're talking about uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so forth, uh, your, your ability to share your viewpoints um, should be protected. You know, I, I think there are lots of other outlets. They're not as popular, so we don't talk about them as much. Some are growing in popularity. I've never been on TikTok or had it, but we have members of the legislature who utilize it and, and use it as outreach, try to reach young voters and, and, and many other forms. So I think one, yes, we have to be open to the fact that there are a bunch out there. And again, you can pick and choose or choose none of them. Um, I, think, I think it's a fair point when we talk about cost and that this is a hard industry to get in if you want to create competitive company. Um, but let's not confuse this conversation with monopoly law and what we have there. And we have that opportunity uh, as a government to deal with that. And I, and I would also say, you know, Facebook was created by one kid with a computer in a dorm room, not with billions of dollars. Obviously, to grow and expand, it took that kind of money, but it was innovative, um, it was creative, and I think we have to be careful while we're not in the first days of technology, we're still in the early days of technology, and if we wanna see how much this can grow and how much it can benefit our lives through multiple ways, not just social media and entertainment, but just so many different avenues, I think we wanna be very careful um, not to overregulate uh, in this kind of still the Wild West days of innovation and technology that's happening and, and, and coming on and, and learning. And I think uh, there's going to be problems along the way, and we do have a role as government to step in at times. But I just think we have to be very careful when that decision is made because we don't want to turn down a new booming industry that is going to change this world uh, dramatically and drastically and in ways that the IT caucus, we've been touring all over the state just learning uh, where technology is taking us, and, and, it, and it's phenomenal, and so I just want to be very careful that we, as a government, don't stop that progress. One thing we've not talked about, we focused on the, the popular uh, platforms, and it's uh, at Travis for Texas if you're on Twitter or Facebook, um, but if you would, uh, the one thing we've not talked about, though, is, is, there, there, is there is evil out there that you can access on this device in a matter of instance, and there is such a thing as the what is it, the Silk Road, and you can get into these subreddits, and you can get into these areas where you can find anything, any depravity ever known to man is accessible through here if you know where to go. We'll have to take now, word do, for do it. Now, do we say, do we say, do we say, yeah, I, you send me those pictures. And uh, so, but do we have a right as, 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 a, uh, as a government, as a reflection of the people who elected us in, in these representative roles, to uh, try to squelch and curtail criminal activities, sex trafficking, human trafficking, all of these things that occur, the, 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 the funding of uh, illegal uh, activities or, or terrorism, uh, and that's out there too. So there are things that need to be regulated in this space. We don't, you know, we do make laws. I, I've always hated the expression, well, you can't legislate morality. That's exactly what we do. You know, since the Code of Hammurabi, we did that. I mean, murder's bad, and we have laws against it. That's legislating morality. And so if we look at the circumstances we have, you know, on, on what's available, I do find it, I'll make, make it aside here, we have a little local controversy brewing around the state about library books on shelves. Does anybody really think your 12 or 13-year-old kid is going in there and dusting off a book on a shelf to find a picture? I'm glad and you're so. buying them, you're buying them <laughs> an iPhone, and saying have fun but um, you know but the point is somewhere there we do have to protect ourselves from ourselves and there are spaces so you know social media can be kind of fun and maybe it's not that important but there's other things that are are, are uh, uh, real I think good and evil concerns that we, I think we do have a responsibility to actually be able to exercise that power you know a lot of the things uh, that we're talking about like whether it's trafficking or stuff that you might find on silk web uh, 
drug dealing, all that kind of stuff on the internet, those are already against the law. Regardless of whether you do that in person, on the phone, through the mail, uh, through social media. So, so we already have those laws. But if individuals want to go and join a subreddit, which in case you don't know is groups on uh, Reddit, um, there's another thing that we have in the First Amendment, which is the right of the people to peaceably assemble. So long as individuals, for whatever reason, want to hang out, talk to each other, talk about politics, talk about how much they hate politics, talk about something completely unrelated, so long as it's legal and lawful, I don't, I don't see it's the government's role to go in and start saying, break it up. We don't like that. Um, I was 14 when I made my first uh, social media company, I guess. We used to call them bulletin board systems, and uh, it was on a 300 baud modem. I screwed up because I called it GeoBBS instead of Facebook. <laughs> I still kind of regret uh, naming it wrong. But literally, it, I would tell you this. It is a lot harder to start a bakery from scratch, uh, no pun intended, but it's a lot harder come up with the maybe 50,000 and the rent and the lease and set that up and get the baking equipment, where pretty much anybody using Python and some other uh, freeware or open source uh, program could start a social media company up in two seconds. Now, can you make it successful? That's always been the rub, regardless of the business. And so regardless of where we are in this, it's a, it's a great topic, and uh, um, we're going to keep working on it. The last question. The title of the panel is The Social Dilemma Revisited. If you've not seen that documentary on Netflix, I strongly encourage you to watch it. It's, uh, it's fascinating and scary at the same time. But in that very documentary, um, in addition to learning that the very tech executives who helped invent social media ban their own children from having social media accounts because of privacy concerns, we also learn that our attention is the product for the social media company's business model. The documentary tells us from start to finish that many social media companies succeed by capturing as much of our attention as they can, then selling that attention to the highest bidders. As the old saying goes, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Legislators on both sides of the political spectrum would agree that there are areas of, of concern when it comes to social media and First Amendment rights and consumer rights in general uh, to a certain extent. What action do you guys think needs to be taken at either the state or federal levels or both to protect free speech? And what does the future look like to you in terms of legislation here in Texas? I have a bill for this, um, and, uh, as and he you, will amend it <laughs> on third reading. <laughs> I like amendments. Uh, and Representative Price, who I see there, helped me out a ton with you know this concept of digital privacy, right? Which is a little different than um, than maybe HB twenty and others. But you're exactly right. Um, through your cell phone, through all of your other electronics, all of your data is is being stored and taken and and used primarily to go and sell back to you or worse, to kind of manipulate you into either changing um, your buying habits uh, primarily. When I filed that bill four years ago, and I, it'll be different this time, I can't tell you how many people, uh, how many lobbyists, how many industry were like, absolutely not. Um, but I think it is important um, from a consumer privacy or consumer protection perspective to, to say, listen, this is data, this information is very personal in nature. I mean, your car knows how much you weigh uh, before and after you go to the restaurant, right? I mean, you, it knows whether you go to church or not on Sunday. It knows you not better than your friends. It knows you sometimes better than you do. Um, and so I do think that we need to, when, when any group holds that much information, there's a risk of it being lost or stolen or being misused. And uh, I hope we can come together on, on fixing that. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and I do appreciate this conversation. I hope you all are taking away the things I've said about this uh, summit before. Uh, I hope you have the same appreciation I do for my colleagues and the people who have been here today uh, and how we exchange these ideas and how I think thoughtful and, and intelligent and, and diligent and really caring about, about Texas and policy uh, the, the folks I'm proud to serve with are. Uh, you know, but to answer your question, John, I, I, I would, I, and, and coming up with what you said, other John, that, um, that 
I do think we need to explore the definition of common carrier. I don't think it fits with the current definition, but I think that's also a 19th century definition of what a common carrier is. And let's bring it into the modern world. Uh, I do think we need to bring them in within some scope of that coverage. But again, our best legislation, where we've done our best work on across the board, is when we get the stakeholders into a room, and they might disagree mightily on a lot of things. It's not just the stakeholders you like. It's everybody who has an interest in this particular uh, area of legislation or policy. And you bring them in and you force them to work together. I, I know Senator Nichols did this uh, working on broadband. You know, He didn't just talk to a few people, he talked to everyone that had some sort of interest. And it's hard work and it's difficult. But to do this in this space, we need the cooperation. We need the help and the leadership of these companies. I don't think these are all bad people. Well, that they're, you know, uh, they're drawing pentagrams in their bathroom. I, you know, I don't, I don't. Now maybe they are, but, uh, but what I, but I think we should at least. I would appreciate a good faith effort on their part to try to help us work through this problem because this problem's not going away. And to JC's point, uh, I think people are demanding something to be done, and it does cross. It does go across party lines. This is not a partisan issue. It's a fundamental difficulty we have grappling with the concept of freedom of speech in a document that was crafted 300 years ago that it's, I, I think it's the most inspired document this side of the Bible. But sometimes we got to help it along. And this is one of those times. I think this, are, these are, this is a unique circumstance. This it came about, when did, he, when did he sit in his dorm room and come up with Facebook? I mean, it's been what? 25 yeah you know uh, uh, you know I got boots older than that and so I think it's something that we do have to come into but I think there's a way and we can get opposing views different stakeholders come together but we've got to have the co cooperation of these entities who want to help us solve the problem and not give us the cold shoulder and, and turn a blind eye towards it hoping that we will just go away because I will assure you we will not uh, because I tell you the, the legislators that go away on this issue, we'll be sent away soon enough by the people who elect us, and, 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 and rightfully so, uh, that if we don't step up and take action, the people will hold us accountable until they find somebody that will take action. Uh, and that's, that's the way this process works. That's what happened with the monopolies back in the day with TJR, not Thomas Jefferson Rusk, for those of us in Nacogdoches, Theodore J. Roosevelt. Um, so uh, I, I think that's where we're heading. And I really hope we will grapple with this issue. Uh, and I can't wait to see the model legislation that uh, uh, Representative Capriglione comes up with. I, this is an important conversation. And, and it's one uh, that I've tried to have just with individuals yesterday and today here. And it's amazing the different opinions that we're hearing just from everyone in this room that I've had the chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with from the people up here. The opinions are drastically different. I think social media is new. Um, it has major influence and impact on our lives. Uh, but I go back to the beginning. You said, if you haven't seen this documentary, I would say you need to go watch it. We need to know what these companies are that we're choosing to give so much of our time to. I think this documentary is incredibly powerful. Uh, it's eye-opening. I think it helps adults to know what they're using and then make decisions based on that information. Now, if we want to have a different conversation around minors in our society, I think we do have a much stronger role to help uh, with regulation when it comes to minors. And if we want to have that conversation about legislation, I'd be happy to. We heard on the previous panel the mental health and what's going on, and we know the social media and many times can bring out the worst in that for, for our children, and we have an extra obligation. But I also think while knowing we have that obligation, I'd love to talk about legislative ideas there to protect our children. We need to make sure we're not over-regulating the adults in our society when um, you know, it's not direct harm to others. So I think that's important. So that's why I don't agree with HB20, um, but I also don't always want to be on Facebook and Twitter and other things. Yeah, I think I think when we go back and look at that, uh, that definition of what common common carrier is, and, and and consider things like that documentary, you have to consider the fact that because we are, um, because of the size of these uh, entities, and the fact that we have become the product, that is the price that we're paying um, to be on these platforms. We 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 are the product. That is the fee that we're signing up for. 
Um, and, and in the same consideration, as, as we look at these large corporations and why we need to regulate them for, um, not, not to res we're not trying to restrict uh, movement of ideas and viewpoints. We're trying to uh, restrict uh, the free movement of different, um, we're trying to regulate the free movement of viewpoints and ideas um, for, for these platforms that are over 50 million people. Um, because they have reached a size where they do reach a threshold that we do need to protect um, the, the viewpoints, uh, the free exchange of viewpoints. Um, at the same time, the reason we have to do that and also consider ideas such as restricting um, the ability of these private companies to sell your data. Um, you know, when we talk about privacy, I, 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 I agree with you on the pri uh, restricting the data use um, and, and the selling of it but it's only being considered because of the size of these corporations and the amount of data that they can collect on you. And so, in the same sense, this is why I believe that we've had to do something similar to HB 20. It's the reason we have to consider um, uh, making sure that we protect the free exchange of viewpoints on these large platforms. And, uh, you know, it, it's really sad the state that we've gotten in. Um, I think that we are, you know, when you look at the news, when you look at social media or anything else, um, we are addicted to fear and anger, and it is fed overly so when it comes to social media and news, and that is that is why the addiction is there. Um, those emotions are addictive, and um, you know, I, 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 I'm not as much as we are fighting for the free exchange of viewpoints. Um, this this also fuels those discussions that are. Uh, can be harmful in terms of uh, the, those, those, the, the anger and fear that we're going to feel as we move through our social media platforms. So um, that's, I'll leave it at that. A great discussion. Thank you, guys. Please join me. Thank you.